will get us started in just one moment here. I think we are ready to dive in. Um, for those of you who haven't heard me say it yet, I am Jessica Juarez Greggs. I'm the Director of Training and Capacity Building here at the Progressive Caucus Action Fund. Um, so glad to see everyone joining us in so many different places. Um, and thank you so much for being here for our first briefing of 2023. Over this next year, our team at PCAF is going to make sure that you all have the information and the tools that you need to fight for bold people-centered policy. Um, and I think this is an incredible topic to, to kick us off with as we start a new Congress. Um, before we start, I just have three quick housekeeping notes. First off, um, the Progressive Caucus Action Fund is a 501c4 organization, but we know that many of you are here representing 501c3 organizations or you're here in an official capacity. So we're not gonna be digging into um, partisan or electoral conversations today. We'll just be diving deep on policy and how we fight for the policy our communities need. Second, we've enabled automatic closed captioning. Um, if you go to the bottom of the screen and click on live transcript, um, you can enable closed captioning for yourself. As it is AI, it's often imperfect, and we will add an improved captions when we send a video to you later. Um, so I hope this makes it a more accessible event for you. Um, and then lastly, we encourage you to ask questions. I already said this earlier, but um, for those of you who just joined, we, we love your questions and we will get to as many as we can. You can drop your question in the chat or in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many as we can. Now I'm thrilled to hand the mic over to our executive director, Gohar Siddiqui. Gohar brings a wealth of experience to this conversation, having held leadership roles in the executive and legislative branches, as well as in nonprofit management. Uh, her work is rooted in her experience as an immigrant to the United States and a first generation college graduate. And she's spent her career fighting for economic, gender and racial um, equality across the progressive movement. So Gohar, over to you. Thanks, Jess, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am really excited to help launch our first um, briefing on this topic. As you know, it's just been a few weeks into the new Congress and it's already clear that we're going to need all of our creativity and all of our champions like many of you at the local, state and federal levels to continue to fight for our rights in Congress. We're dealing with a divided Congress. Uh, as you know, Democrats control the Senate while Republicans control the House. This means that each party can throw off the other's agenda by making sure that many bills don't move through the chamber if they don't like those bills. And that means that it's going to be difficult to get many of our priorities to become law through legislation. But that does not mean there isn't hope to make change in the next two years. And that's what we're here to talk about. Um, many of us think that you know Congress passes bills. That's what they do, right? But you know, Congress is a legislative body, but that's not all that Congress does. Actually, members of Congress have a lot of tools at their disposal that allow them to affect change without passing legislation. And those tools are especially important for the party who's not in control. And the party that is in control of the particular chamber decides which bills move forward and which don't. So today we're going to look at look beyond bills, beyond legislation, to talk about what are the other tools that members of Congress have at their disposal. We're gonna talk about hearings, we're gonna talk about investigative reports, letters that come out of members' offices. We're gonna talk about working with agencies in the executive branch, and also about the power of the media and how members of Congress can use their platform to raise the issues that many of us care about and work alongside us as movement partners. So all the tools that I mentioned play a key role in allowing our members of Congress to hold a corporations accountable, ensure that the executive branch is following the letter of the law and upholding our rights. So I think today is the perfect time to learn about these tools so that we don't let the next two years go by without trying to make positive change at the federal level. So this is 
going to be um, a technical briefing. It may be a lot to digest all at once, but the Progressive Caucus Action Fund just released an explainer that's going to go through many of these tools. Um, and you'll have this, we're going to put the link in to the chat right now, but you'll also receive it in the resource toolbox that you'll get if you registered for this um, briefing. We'll send you a bunch of resources afterwards. So with that, I am going to um, introduce a video from our special guest, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Um, wow, we were really excited to have her be with us live today. As you know, Congress is in session and she had a last minute um, scheduling issue and couldn't be here live. We really appreciate that she was able to send us a video that is tailored towards answering a lot of the questions that I've brought up already. Um, as many of you know, Congresswoman Jayapal is serving her fourth term in Congress. She represents Washington's seventh district. She is a lifelong organizer and progressive champion. Um, she's the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the largest Congressional Progressive Caucus yet, and a champion for the people fighting for Medicare for all, immigration reform, economic justice, LGBTQIA rights, and so much more. And prior to becoming a member of Congress, uh, Representative Jayapal served in the Washington State Senate and founded One America, the largest immigrant rights organization in Washington State. And with that, let's hear from the Congresswoman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you today in person, but I'm very glad that you're gathering to build power, to build community, and to strategize for the work ahead for our progressive movement. I wanna thank the Progressive Caucus Action Fund for all of your work, including the convening today. The question posed to this panel today is how can members of Congress fight for our communities when passing progressive legislation seems unlikely? The answer encompasses both specific tools we can use and a mindset that I'm guided by in the 118th Congress, and I encourage you all to consider. I'll start with the tools of the administration. During the first half of the president's term, thanks to years of advocacy from progressives in movements and in Congress, we have seen the Biden administration adopt real progressive governance. We released our Progressive Caucus Executive Action Agenda last March, and since then there has been significant progress made. They've enacted orders to close the Affordable Care Act's family glitch and to expand healthcare access to one million people. They've spurred renewable energy technology and invested in communities while centering environmental justice, redesignated or expanded temporary protected status for 12 countries, taken steps to ensure immigrant workers can report workplace misconduct without fear of retaliation and more. Most notably, the president canceled student debt for 43 million people. And even though this relief is being temporarily blocked by conservative attorneys general, I am confident that the administration will be victorious and the order will erase the debt of 20 million people and lessen the burden of student loans for millions more. After the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade, we issued another agenda to protect reproductive freedom and the administration responded by taking steps to protect access to contraception, to medication abortion, to emergency medical treatment, and the right to travel for abortion care. The Progressive Caucus will continue to push the administration to be bold and audacious with its executive authority, including to raise the overtime threshold and give millions of workers a raise and continue to take on big pharma and lower the price of prescription drugs. The federal agencies also have a real power here, and we've seen them use it. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued policy to remove medical debt from credit reports. The Federal Trade Commission proposed a rule to ban non-competes, which lower wages and keep workers trapped. The Federal Drug Administration expanded access to medication abortion by allowing it to be dispensed in retail pharmacies. So we'll continue to push for more progressive policymaking across the federal government. 
The second tools are those that we have within Congress. It's true that progressive laws aren't likely to pass the House under a Republican majority, but that doesn't mean that everything is off the table. We can continue to defend the American people by conducting robust populist oversight, holding corporations accountable for price gouging and anti-competitive practices. We can continue to go on offense by convening forums and holding shadow hearings, issuing reports and advancing legislation to show people what we care about and what we will do when we're back in the majority. The third set of tools belong to all of us. With Democrats in the House minority, the voices outside of the people have an essential role to play. When Republicans move to strip rights or economic relief from the people, whether by attacking trans people or trying to cut Social Security and Medicare as they are with this debt ceiling fight, that is the time for all of us to get loud and to push back. When the Republican House is advancing bad legislation, that is the moment to lift the progressive agenda and show what we are about versus what they are about. This is the mindset shift that I encourage you all to consider. We have to be not just an opposition party, but also a proposition party. I know that being in the minority is tough. I came into it when I was elected in 2016. At that time, Democrats didn't have the House or the Senate, and Trump was in the White House. It's really easy to feel out in the wilderness. But remember back to those first years of the Trump administration. It was never clearer what we were fighting for. It was never more urgent to come together. Our work in that moment and in this one is to articulate a vision of a just, equitable future where everyone, no matter your immigration status, gender, race, income, or zip code, can not just live, but thrive. I was an organizer for 20 years before coming to Congress. I didn't set out to become a politician. And like many of you, I was called to this work because my community was under attack. It was just after 9-11 when Arab, Muslim, South Asian, Middle Eastern, and Sikh people experienced hate crimes, unconstitutional surveillance, and detention. People were attacked on the street just for wearing a hijab or a turban because somebody believed that they looked like the people who carried out the 9-11 attack, people who looked like me. And I couldn't sit by. It was an uphill battle going up against the Bush administration. We were fighting for racial justice, fair treatment for all of our people and those perceived to be other, immigrant rights at a time when it was deeply unpopular and when few politicians would even set foot in a mosque or a temple. So how do we do it? We came together. We built a coalition of organizations and leaders who could work across difference and stand up for justice. We did it when it wasn't easy, when it wasn't popular, because we did it together. We lived that truth, that the strength of movements is the people who increase that strength by being in coalition. And that is how we will meet this challenge and this moment. We will use all of the tools that we have and will continue to push for the country we want to see. Thank you for all you do. Great. Thank you so much to Congresswoman Jayapal for sharing her insights with us. We really appreciate it. And now we're going to dive into a more detailed conversation about those tools that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I want to mention one tool that we're not going to talk about today, and that is the appropriations process or the power of the purse that Congress has. It is an absolutely critical tool, no matter who's in charge, but we're going to have a whole briefing on just the appropriations process on February 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So make sure that you don't miss that briefing because we're not going to deep go into the appropriations process here today. And Hejin will put that link in. And now I'm going to turn to our panel. It's my pleasure to introduce Rob Weissman, the president of Public Citizen, many of you know. Rob is a staunch public interest advocate and activist, as well as an expert on corporate and government accountability. Before leading Public Citizen, he fought for corporate accountability as editor 
of the Multinational Monitor and a public interest attorney with the Center for Study of Responsive Law. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be with you, Gohar, and, and everybody else on the call. So Public Citizen is one of the leading organizations pushing back on corruption, corporate giveaways, and the erosion of our democracy. You've often worked with Congress to ensure that Congress leverages its oversight power to fight for everyday people. I'm wondering if you could answer this question. What opportunities do you see in this Congress on oversight powers to protect our democracy from corporate influence? Yeah, well, they're boundless, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what Congress should do is hold regular, intense, and investigative hearings looking at how corporations influence our politics, influence our regulatory agencies, and act in the private sector. So Congress should be looking at the question of if American people overwhelmingly want deep cuts in drug prices, why aren't we getting them? If they want a minimum wage raised, why aren't we getting it? If they want more environmental protection, why aren't we getting it? And on and on and on. I think we saw some um, significant progress in that kind of oversight in the House in the last Congress. I think we're going to see some of that on the Senate side um, in this Congress. Uh, it's not so likely to happen in the House through hearings, um, although there may be some opportunities, especially for abuses in just the private sector. Uh, but what does that say for Democratic members who may want to be critical of corporate power but don't get to control the hearing process. I think some of the things that Representative Jayapal was touching on are crucial. Just because you don't get to control the hearing process doesn't mean you don't have oversight power. It doesn't mean you don't have the ability to look at agencies and look at how corporations influence, block, and slow agencies from delivering for the American people. It doesn't mean you don't have the ability to confront corporations head on about their abuses, whether it's a ticket master kind of case a drug price gouging kind of case, oil profiteering kind of case instance, or on and on, and demand answers from corporations. When members of Congress ask, corporations feel obligated to answer. So it's a, you know, you don't have as much power in the minority, but you still have a lot of power and authority. And I think it's really crucial that Democrats use that, um, even though they don't have the same levers in the House that they did in the previous Congress. Thank you, Rob. So I wanna talk about a specific issue that you uh, alluded to, prescription drug prices. Everybody on this call knows prescription drug prices have been skyrocketing for years. And all the polls show that Americans have wanted reforms to reduce these prices and make them make prescription drugs more affordable. And we finally saw a major step forward with the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, which allows the federal government to negotiate with drug companies to lower prescription drug prices. A lot of other countries do this. It's very effective and actually brings prices down. And this was a result of a lot of work for a number of years from organizations like yours and like-minded members of Congress to finally get this passed into law, this ability for the federal government to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies. So what sorts of tactics did you and your advocates use to make this possible? Yeah, so I think one thing that's important before I get into the specifics as we're thinking about this Congress is to recognize that you know victories in Congress, legislative victories in Congress, don't happen with a snap of a finger. So it's not, although it is true, though there are some important exceptions, we're not likely to win lots of great progressive victories in the House this year or next year. The work that we do now will ensure that it's possible to win those victories in the future. And if we don't do the work now, we won't win them in the future. So if we take the case of, of drug pricing, in, in 2005, Congress adopted Medicare prescription, uh, the Medicare Part D program to cover prescription drugs for seniors. It was actually probably the most corrupt deal 
in recent American political history. The price of that was that the government wouldn't try to control the prices of the drugs it was now paying for. Pharma opposed originally the idea, but they loved the idea of, hey, we're going to get a bigger market and there'll be no price controls on it. The main guy who negotiated that deal left Congress uh, shortly after and became head of the Pharmaceutical Trade Association. So quite a story. So we've known from the origin of this program that it needed to be reformed. But over time, um, as the prescription D program, Part D program got bigger, started spending more money, started draining taxpayers more and more, failed to adopt price controls that would have helped the private market as well, people got used to it. Uh, members in Congress got used to it. So yes, consumers, Americans across the country were demanding action, but there was not really serious talk about reform in Congress. Um, and in fact, as we started taking up this issue more seriously uh, around 2017, we found people scared about talking seriously about Medicare price negotiation. It seemed like it was too much to even contemplate against the power of Big Pharma, which is the biggest lobby in Washington, D.C. So it was years of, of doing work. Now, this is an issue where the public is overwhelming in its view. And once, and the more aggressive you talk about uh, price reductions on, on against Big Pharma, the stronger support you get. So there was a lot of polling done, just in, and that, that was marshaled in Congress. Like This is overwhelmingly popular. Yes, you got to deal with the lobby, but the people are with you. A lot of research done by us and others to sort of document the problem and showing, for example, the huge disparities you referenced between what Americans pay for prescription drugs and what people pay in other rich countries. There was mobilization of people across the country. A lot of that was organic because it is the case that people are calling their members of Congress all the time and demanding action, whether or not anyone is helping organize them. But organizing them helped give a, a focus to the demand and a push for uh, actual action to deal with this issue of Medicare price negotiation. Then the Democrats started running on the issue because they saw it as an effective issue. And as they took it up, you know, that, that doesn't mean that it's, we're going to get deliverance on it, but it is an important step uh, to create some sense of, of obligation. And even once, uh, as you know, even once the president said he wanted to do this, and there were relatively robust proposals for how to do this from the House, in the course of negotiations, Big Pharma and its allies in Congress managed to water down very aggressive proposals to something that's very modest. So a huge step forward compared to doing nothing, which is what pharma has managed to have for the last two decades, but still very modest and a lot more for us to do. But to, you know, just to close by answering the core of the question, none of that happens, but for years of work, marshaling the evidence, moving the media, getting people engaged, having people contact their members of Congress, do all the stuff that's on the, in that toolkit, writing letters to the editor and everything else, calling in, emailing, all that stuff. Actually, it all adds up. And then at the end of the day, taking it over the edge for, you know, not the huge victory we wanted, but a really vitally important one nonetheless. That's right. Thank you so much, Rob. And um, to the point of the person on the chat saying, um, as a veteran, your prescription drug costs are very low. I just want to mention as a side that I believe um, we were able to negotiate for veterans with uh, pharmaceutical companies to keep those prices down for a number of years before we've been able to get this win. So yeah, that's right. The, the VA prices yeah. are about 40 percent less than Medicare. Right. So clearly it was and continues to be an effective tool for keeping uh, drug prices down. Thanks again, Rob, for being here and for going through these strategies that have really helped to improve people's lives in this country. So now I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, Aisa Conchola Bañez, who is a senior advisor for policy and strategy at the Student Borrower Protection Center. Aisa brings a decade of experience working in Congress, executive agencies, and doing advocacy work to advance policy solutions to improve the lives of workers and families. Her work was essential in finally bringing about executive action on student debt relief. So Aisa, 
As a former Hill staffer and as an advocate, you know what it's like when your party may not be in charge of the chamber you're working for. I know you've worked in the Senate and in the House. So what are some ways that members of Congress can amplify an issue or move the needle on an agenda when passing legislation isn't the option? Thank you so much, Gohar, for that question. Hi, folks. It's such a you know a pleasure to be um, part of this conversation and and to talk about this issue. You know, when I was thinking about this topic, I always kind of just chuckle because I think about how we all learned about the legislative process and you know we're at, we're informed by you know the the schoolhouse rock version of how our institutions should work and how just the reality is just so different from from that, you know, that that um, that story that was told to us almost this like romanticized view of, of how policy is made. And so, you know, the, the the reality is, you know, for too long, our institutions have have really only worked for, you know, the, the privileged few and oftentimes, you know, at the expense of of some of our most marginalized folks. And so I think as advocates and, and as members who, you know, and as staff who are committed to working on behalf of communities that have historically been left behind, it's it's on us to be as creative as possible to think through, you know, all of the tools in a member's, you know, toolbox. Um, and, you know, that's why it's so question, so important to have kind of conversations like these so that, you know, we could be the best advocates on behalf of our issue and on behalf of our constituencies. Um, and so one of the best pieces of advice that I had received from a mentor back when, you know, I started as a very, very baby staffer was, you know, that um, you know, legislation was only like one tool as part of like a host of, you know, various tactics that a member and that staff have at their disposal, um, you know, and some of the best members, some of the best staff and some of the best advocates make it a point to familiarize themselves with kind of the host and array of, of tools that, that members have. Um, and really kind of embed that within their, their larger strategy. Um, so everything from, you know, as, as, as Rob has mentioning, like oversight and investigative, you know, projects, letters, um, really utilizing hearings as an opportunity to really kind of capitalize on the platform and to educate folks, um, even within this context, even with the House, you know, with Democrats, um, being in the minority, while they might not control the agenda of the hearing, they each still have their five minutes. And that's their five minutes to ask their questions, to get their, their responses out of, you know, corporate CEOs or whoever is being summoned for before the committee um, to either get the information that, that the American people deserve or correct the record and really push back against the, you know, false narratives that we're going to be hearing out of out of the Republican majority. And so, you know, I think still utilizing question um, question lines, you know, having um, finding ways to help members of Congress and their staff think through creative question lines to get information out into the open. Um, and you know, one other kind of tactic that folks have is, you know, even if let's say, you know, you're you're hoping to work with an office to get. A question line in a hearing and, and the member doesn't get to that specific question, you know, every single member, regardless of whether you're in the majority, has the privilege um, to submit questions for the record. So those are questions in writing that all witnesses, regardless, again, of whether or not a member is in the majority, um, has to respond in writing. Um, so that's also another really good tactic when you're trying to get information, um, do some of that investigative work, groundwork and, 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 and narrative kind of development and, and level setting um, that folks have you know, at their disposal. Um, and you know, really thinking through standalone amendments on the floor, finding ways to kind of organize around that. Um, but I think you know, one of the biggest tools and we've really seen this generation, this new generation of members of Congress really utilizing, you know, the power of their own individual platforms. Um, I think decades ago, you know, the way that members and party kind of communications was very different than we see today. You know, you have some members of Congress who have more followers than, you know, leaders of entire parties, right? Um, and so finding ways to, to also kind of work with an office to, to build awareness around your issue and, and, and have um, um, that kind of narrative building um, and using that with, you know, using that in partnership with a member um, could really be a great way to raise awareness um, on, on your issue as well. 
Um, so I think, you know, using all of those tools and, and knowing that legislation is really only one of those tools and honestly should really be used and looked at kind of last as part of an overarching strategy um, is really kind of a, an all hands on deck approach to kind of moving the needle on your issue. Thank you for that, Aisa. So not to generalize too much, but I think that most members of Congress take think about three things when they're trying to decide whether to take on a policy issue. I think those three things are how the issue plays out in their state or district, the politics of the issue, and the timing. And I want to focus on that last part when is the right time to make a push on an issue if there isn't necessarily a connection to what's going on in Congress or in the news? And I was hoping you could answer this question in the context of the student loan debt relief um, campaign that you were so involved in. Yeah, I mean, that that is a great question. And I wish there was like this formulaic kind of answer, but the fact is there isn't. Um, you know, I think to Rob's point, like these wins take time and whether or not a member is willing to make this issue their top, you know, issue that they're going to run with and, and, and be a champion on, you have to have the conversation. You have to have those introductory conversations. You have to start informing and educating and, 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 and coalition building um, before, you know, that moment, before that, you know, your issue hits the headlines. Um, you know, thinking back to, you know, the fight and, and the movement and extremely diverse intergenerational kind of coalition that was really coalesced around, around the debt cancellation fight. I mean, that has, that took us over 10 years to really even make the issue something that was considered a mainstream kitchen table issue. Um, and there were several, you know, conversations with members who, or with policymakers that really saw this issue as like, there's no way that this issue is going to, you know, be, it, it's too extreme, it's too fringe, it's 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 almost too progressive. Um, and at that point, I mean, I just imagine how different of a world we'd be in if, if advocates kind of took that and said, okay, well, it's just not the right time. Like, you have to, you have to build the groundwork, you have to do the research, you have to build a coalition that makes it so that members don't have a choice, so that policymakers don't have a choice but to address an issue. And I think with this fight in particular, over 10 years, not only did they normalize just how many folks experience, you know, student debt and 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 it how it impacts an entire family, right? You know, and it impacts folks from all walks of life, um, you know, from the you know single mother who is trying to support their family, um, but is burdened with student debt and can't you know is literally having to pick between keeping up with their student loan payments or you know their their monthly rent, or the seniors having their you know social security garnished because they have defaulted on a student loan, um, you know entire generations of folks who were putting off you know saving for retirement and starting or growing a family. Um, because of the burden of student debt. And it got to the point where members of Congress were hearing from borrowers in their districts at every event. And it really kind of, the way that folks kind of built that coalition was we effectively showed that student debt is such a core piece of a family and a community's economic health. And that the, the it played such a huge role in communities of color who have historically been deprived of, of, of wealth building opportunities and um, was really, you know, student debt in itself was, was exacerbating some of our deepest economic inequalities in our country. And I think by showing that this was not just some fringe issue, but rather an issue that dominated kitchen table conversations at dinner and determined folks as over our overarching economic health was a really kind of successful way in showing that when we were talk, you know, when we're talking about any kind of economic recovery, you couldn't have that without also addressing this issue. And so I think when the time kind of came and, you know, I think the, the, the pandemic showed that, you know, folks were just, the economic hurt out of the pandemic was just 
hitting so hard that we had to make the case that an, uh, any kind of economic recovery from this had to include student debt relief. And I think all of the stars aligned, but none of that was by accident. It was 10 years of just grueling work, storytelling, narrative building, and a lot of the times hearing from folks that, you know what, it's not the right time. There's not, there, folks can't get behind this um, and not taking no for an answer. Thank you so much, Aisa. That is absolutely right. Um, we are going to, I'm sure, come back to student loan debt and uh, in our Q&A. So for now, I'm going to move on to our, so we can hear from our very own Legislative Affairs Director here at PCAF, Kat Rowland. Kat joined our team after nearly a decade on Capitol Hill, and she is truly an expert on demystifying Congress. So I'm really happy that she's here today. And Kat, I wanna talk a little bit about agenda setting and why that's important. Often members of Congress, just by virtue of their positions, have direct access to public and media attention on an issue. Um, that many of us who are not members of Congress don't have. So why is this kind of agenda setting in the media so important? Thanks, Gohar, and hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I love this question because I would love to see more members harnessing their agenda setting power this Congress. It's such an important tool because members can get issues on the media's radar, and that then gets them on the public's radar. And maybe one of the best examples I've seen of this being done well comes from Congresswoman Cori Bush last Congress. Um, folks might remember that the eviction moratorium that was put in place because of COVID was set to expire um, right around when Congress was leaving for August recess in 2021. And we'd seen a number of COVID protections expire at that point. We've seen several more expire since. And there's typically been pretty little fanfare, um, but that was not the case with this one. Congresswoman Bush slept on the Capitol steps for multiple nights in an unseasonably chilly and rainy time in a DC summer. Aisa, I think you were there. I know I was there for a little bit and it was wet and it was cold. And she brought, it was such a, a powerful image that brought attention to the need to keep the eviction ban in place. Her sitting got a ton of media attention nationwide. And within days, the administration extended the moratorium. And her success as a freshman member of Congress didn't take legislative maneuvering. It didn't take buy-in from anybody else. It was her direct action on a specific problem that got the issue onto front pages and onto news shows, and that galvanized the public outcry that led to the fix that she wanted to see. So this is just an incredible example of members using their agenda setting power successfully, and it shows that even a single member can make a huge difference when they harness that power. That's right. And just staying on this topic of agenda setting for a moment, let's talk a little bit more about the chairperson of a committee and the important role that that person plays in deciding what topics are going to be covered in certain hearings, when those hearings are going to happen. The party in charge um, decides how many witnesses they get on their issue and typically the minority gets fewer witnesses. So that attention to a hearing topic is really important. But the chair is not the only member who can use that platform to shine light on an issue. As Aisa talked about earlier, there's the time that each member gets. But I wanna turn this issue of hearings into the question of what can advocates do when it comes to congressional hearings to push for their issues? Kat, can you answer that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to your point, if your party is in the majority, you literally set the media's agenda by scheduling a hearing on the issue you care about, and then the press has to cover it, and you put a spotlight on the issue for the public to see. 
members of the minority do not have that opportunity, but they can still use hearings to tremendous effect. And that is what advocates should be encouraging their representatives to do. And Aisa explained this really well. Um, and I'll, I'll echo everything that she said, because it's really important. During a committee hearing, every member of the committee, whether they're, they're in the majority or the minority, gets a chance to ask questions of the witnesses that have come there to testify. And even if the hearing is on a topic that they don't believe should be the committee's focus, even if they think that those witnesses aren't sympathetic to their positions, they have a chance to reframe the narrative and get those witnesses on the record on subjects that they, the witness, might prefer not to talk about at all, but that the member cares about. And so I'll I'll give an example. When I worked for a member on the House Energy and Commerce Committee's health subcommittee, at the time, eight to 10 years ago, the Republican majority was holding repeated hearings on what they felt were the Affordable Care Act's failings. Um, Democrats in the minority used those hearings to ask questions about the harm that would befall people without the ACA. So how many people would lose insurance coverage? How many hospitals that care for vulnerable populations would close without the law? This is a great way to shift attention during the hearing to the topics that you want to see discussed, because even if you don't get a straight answer to your questions, the witness dodging the question can demonstrate to people that they don't have a good answer. You can clip those dodges, you can put the video on social media, or if it's egregious enough, reporters might cover it on their own. And on top of that, this gets back to something Rob mentioned earlier, those moments can become really helpful years down the line because just a few years later, we were fighting to protect the ACA when Republicans actually did have complete control of Washington and the ability to get rid of it. And as folks on this call know, they did not succeed because we were able to make the case that this law was critical and had to stay in place. So to sum up, if you're an advocate, you should follow the congressional committees that cover the issues that you care about. And once you know a hearing is on the books that's even tangentially related to the topic that you want to shine the spotlight on, you should encourage members on that committee to use their question time to focus on your issue. Make clear to them why this is a good use of their precious five minutes. And if they do it, make sure to amplify that moment. Um, and if if you check out our explainer that Heejin dropped in the chat earlier and that we'll send around later, we included a couple of video clips of members doing this really, really well. Um, so I hope folks will check that out if they want some inspiration. Thank you so much, Kat. And you can also try to influence the topic of the hearing as well. We are not um, suggesting that, you know, there's no way to do that. Members um, can members of the committee, members off the committee can write letters to the chair, regardless of which party they're in and say, do write, uh, we want you to have a hearing on X topic. So that is also an option for advocates to push members on and off the committee to ask for a hearing on the topic that you care about. So Kat, one last question before we get into the Q&A from the audience. I know we've already received a bunch of them. So we've been hearing a lot about discharge petitions as a way that some bipartisan legislation could get through the House. Could you please explain what a discharge petition is and how it might work? Yeah, thanks for the chance to talk about this, because I think it's it's important that folks know when a discharge position can be helpful and when it can't. Um, so to back up a moment, the Speaker of the House schedules votes on the House floor. A discharge petition is a parliamentary tool that lets members who are not the speaker force a vote on the House floor, but using one successfully is not easy. Um, and let me talk briefly about the process. So a member of Congress will introduce a bill. That bill gets referred to a committee, and the committee is basically in charge of that bill, and they decide whether it's going to be acted on or not. To use a discharge petition, the bill has to sit in that committee for 30 legislative days when the House is in session. This might not seem like very long, but to put it in context, February has 28 days. The House is only scheduled to be in session for eight of them. And so it could easily take well over two calendar months to reach what is a 30 legislative day threshold. Then a majority of House members, 218, need to sign a petition calling for a vote on that bill on the House floor. 
So this needs to be a bill that more than half of Congress thinks deserves a vote. Republicans have more than 218 members in the House, but if this process is being used, theoretically it's because the Speaker doesn't want this bill to come to the floor, otherwise he would just schedule it himself. So it's going to require a number of majority party members to publicly go against their leader's wishes to make this vote happen. Once you reach 218 signatures, there is another seven legislative day waiting period, after which the member can give notice to their colleagues that they intend to bring this bill up for a vote. Remember, going back to that February example, this seven day period can take what in the real world is maybe a month. Um, and then the speaker has to schedule a vote within two legislative days. So when is this process useful? You need a lot of lead time and you have to have an issue that some members are willing to stick their necks out for. It's not going to be useful to solve a problem that needs to be fixed immediately. Uh, where I think this wouldn't work is on, say, a government spending bill to avoid an imminent shutdown. If for no other reason than those bills' contents typically aren't finalized until very shortly before government funding is about to lapse. And so this lengthy process is not going to be feasible. The discharge petition is getting talked about a lot with respect to the debt ceiling. And it's plausible that this could work because we know the debt ceiling has to be raised this year. We know that House Democrats and a number of House Republicans are not on board with the Speaker's proposal that critical programs get slashed in order to avoid a debt default crisis. Um, I think we'd need to see action fairly soon for this to work, but it does seem to be on the table. Thank you, Kat. Really appreciate that technical detail for these rules that we're all, those of us, um, who haven't worked in the house are um, still trying to wrap our brains around. So thank you so much. And now we're going to go to the questions from the audience. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to uh, bring those up. Hi, everybody. And I promise to do my very best to get them all in. So I may do a little bit of, of combining and rearranging <laughs> to get to as many as I can. Um, I wanted to start with a really practical question, which which is just how do we find out what hearings are coming up? And I'll throw that to anyone on the panel who wants to jump in. Yes, this is all publicly available information. So if you are following a particular committee, um, you can sign up for updates from their committee, from their press shop. Um, oftentimes when a committee is, a hearing is noticed, that will go out on their press list. Um, but oftentimes you'll see a, a schedule of upcoming hearings, subcommittee hearings. Um, usually depending on the committee rules, the, the hearings themselves are noticed within a week. And then um, the actual witnesses are noticed within a couple of days before the hearing. Um, in addition, you can also see the written testimony that is submitted um, from the witnesses as well. Um, and the written testimony is oftentimes much longer than the um, oral testimony that, that, that the witnesses deliver at the hearing itself. Um, so this is a great way if you're working with an office to think through that question line or potential angles to utilize that their, you know, precious five minutes, you know, having access to those, that, that testimony is, is crucial because you'll be able to know what the topics these folks are going to be discussing, um, what, you know, issues they're going to emphasize on and how to push back, um, how to push back to, to, you know, on that, on that issue in particular. And again, none, of, like all of this is publicly available. Um, so it's, it's all fair game. Absolutely. And I want to take moderator's privilege to uh, to remind folks that the Progressive Caucus Action Fund has a newsletter called the DC Download that comes out about once a week um, with a lot of previews of things coming up um, either on the floor or in committees. And so um, I think we can drop that in the chat. Uh, I can't talk and drop things in the chat at the same time, but someone will do it for me, I know. Um, and if not, we'll send it out also in our follow up. But I um, encourage you to sign up for that if you want to see what's coming up um, on the floor. Um, I want to turn to another question. Um, some of the topics we've talked about have um, had really large, uh, you know, uh, constituencies. Um, and we got a question from Beatrice about how do um, issues that affect a smaller minority, such as trans folks, 
um, get the same attention that, um, especially when the most vocal people on the issue tend to be um, attacking attacking those people? How do we generate empathy for issues that affect a smaller number of people um, that may not be able to recognize or considered an interest group that's worthy of being heard? I could take a quick crack, uh, quick uh, answer to that and then we can go around. I would say obviously find champions for that issue um, who are on the committees of jurisdiction for the issue. So then that member can tell the chair when there's a piece of legislation moving through the committee where your issue falls into that, then you know there are multiple members on that committee that you've championed to say, I need this change in this bill before I will vote for this bill to move through the committee. So, you know, the jurisdictions of each committee understanding that well and which members sit on that. And when it's time to reauthorize that bill, your champions can say, this is the win that I need in order to support a larger bill um, to pass through the committee and then through the floor. Yeah, I think that's a great point, point Gohar. I think from you know an organizing perspective and, and a narrative building perspective, I think really trying to couch and, and to your to to the example that you said, you know, trans rights and, and trans justice issues as part of a larger push for, you know, human rights, civil rights, you know, economic justice, racial justice, all of these issues are intertwined. You know, people, my forever favorite member of Congress, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley always says, people do not live and operate and navigate the world in silos and neither should our policies, right? And so I think being able to couch your fight within the larger, and, and it's 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 true, right? It, couching this issue within the larger fight for for equity and 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 justice and, and ensuring that folks are seen for you know their their full humanity is absolutely the way to do that. Um and I also just want to to recognize just like how hard that fight is right now, especially considering all of the attacks that we're seeing out of, you know, Republican governors. And it is egregious. And I think one of the things we need to do is 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 make it very clear that, you know, attacking trans folks, attacking trans children, you know, is an attack on all children, is an attack on, you know, all folks um, and their ability to, you know, live and, and navigate this world in the way that they should. So that is just kind of one piece that I think um, I would like to give in terms of just how to organize and, and really raise awareness um, on those issues too. Absolutely. Could I jump in, Jess? Yeah, absolutely. But to to build on that, I think this, this is one thing I neglected to say, and I think there's some ways that sort of, if, you, if you're advocating for, as, as described, um, you know, a relatively smaller group, in some ways it's similar to, in some ways it's different from when you've got a broader constituency. But I think one thing that's important in, in both cases and I should have mentioned this, is trying to humanize issues. So if you bring like people who are directly affected, so in the example I was talking about on drug prices, part of what we did was people who could not afford their medicines, having them tell their story. Um, and that, some of us are motivated by the idea of justice. And I think that's admirable um, and important, but not everybody kind of thinks in sort of that principle, but it's hard not to be moved by personal stories. And then, I, so I think that's always true. And, and before I get sort of the more direct answer, it was, we're thinking about tools, like there's, besides as advocates, as movements, you know, we can sort of find people who can tell their story. We can throw up clips on social media and stuff. Members of Congress can also engage in conversations with these people. It could, uh, it could be a two minute clip or a three or 30 second clip on social. That can be a really powerful way for members to, both elevate these people and also sort of find a way to engage the topic. Um, when you're talking about, particularly about sort of a smaller community, whether it's trans people or anything else, same thing. And even more so, I think it, it's kind of the reverse. Like a lot of the hatred, I think, and the trans stuff is just generic, right? It's like, it's about an idea. It's not about people. When you confront and offer up people to tell their stories, it's much harder for people to sort of carry forward that hatred. So I think that's really important. And then sort of one more sort of kind of insider thing, building what Gohar was saying and finding champions. Members of Congress, although it's sometimes hard to believe it, actually are human beings. 
And so they uh, both they relate to human beings, they have their own human problems, they've got families. Um, so if you have a disease and you you got some particular disease issue, there's someone in Congress who either has that disease or has a family member who has that disease. There are a lot of, there may not be a lot of trans members of Congress. There are a lot of members of Congress with trans kids. And so the people who can sort of relate to it directly, if you can find them, they're going to sort of be your champions in a different way because they feel it in a different way. And, you know, it's it's true. It's a big, Congress is big. So it's true for almost everything. There's There's someone, if you work hard enough to look, who relates directly to whatever constituency you're talking about. Absolutely. And I want to squeeze in one more question if we can under the line, but in case we run out of time, I just want to make one quick announcement, which is if you've enjoyed this conversation, please sign up for our next one about budget and appropriations. We'll drop the link in the chat and also share it over email. And then I also want to encourage you if you clicked in a live now link, which means if, you're, if your name shows up as an event participant and not your actual name, that means we don't have your email. Um, so please click the link that we're dropping in the chat and sign up so you will get this recording and get all the materials that we're going to send out. So make sure you get that. And now I'm going to try to squeeze one more question in under the line and I'm going to combine a bunch of them, but we got a bunch of questions that relate to sort of ethics broadly. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to direct this one your way. Um, but what are the, some of the things that we can do to strengthen the ethics um, for congressmen or just shine a light on, on, on sort of ethics in, in Congress? We got a Broad, broad range of questions, both about the Office of Ethics and, and just whether or not certain things are legal or um, um, possible for members of Congress to do. So I think just just a, where are we on <laughs> fighting for, um, you know, making sure our public public officials are working for us and what are maybe some opportunities or challenges? I don't know. That's a very big question for like a minute and a half, but I'm <laughs> throw it your way. I'll go real quick. So the big problem is that Congress sets its own ethics rules. Um, and it's the Republicans have started out in a really bad way by very significantly diminishing the power of this thing called the somebody put in the chat, the Office of Congressional Ethics. So that's just a reality. Two things sort of going forward, whatever Congress is doing, which is truthfully never going to be that great in terms of self-policing, outside pressure makes a difference. Um, even if you think they're immune to it, they are not. And we keep knocking and um, it makes a difference. If you look at the Trump administration, the ethics scandals took out lots of members of Cong uh, lots of members of the cabinet, especially early on. And it wasn't because they violated the law necessarily. They did violate the law all the time, but that wasn't why they left. They left because of all the public pressure around it. And the second thing is across party, there are some things that people agree on. So two areas where we may be able to make some progress are stock trading by members of Congress, and I put in the chat about this, the revolving door, there are a lot of Republicans who, for whatever reason, agree that it shouldn't be okay for members to leave Congress and then go work for industries that are lobbying Congress afterwards. So those are two areas where there may be possibilities, even with Republican control, to move forward on ethics issues. Thank you so much. I know that was a giant question in, in a very short amount of time. And I want to, I know folks have to drop off. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us for our first briefing. Thank you to our incredible panel and to Representative Jayapal for giving us those inspiring remarks at the beginning to set us off on the right uh, direction. So thank you everyone for being a part of this conversation for all of the incredible work you do. Um, and again, if you have not given us your email address, please sign up on the link in the chat. We'll drop it one more time um, and, and hang on a second before we drop off. Um, so thank you everyone for, for being a part of this conversation. And I am so glad that we have so many tools to work with in our toolbox as we face the next couple of years and continue to build people-powered policy across this country. Thank you everyone um, so much. And we look forward to seeing you on February 16th as we tackle the appropriations process. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And um, I will hang on in, uh, for a number of moments just in case you need to save that link. Um, but thank you so much uh, for joining us for this very first uh, briefing of 2023.